Hello, Maya students. This is the Unit 9 Fancy Animation Tutorial. We are going to learn in this lesson how to set up dependencies and hierarchical animation. Um, a hierarchical structure has parents and children, which um, the children inherit the parents' attributes. We're going to learn how to bind a skeleton, create joints, uh, name joints, uh, parent joints, and use inverse kinematics to pose a skeleton, also known as IK. We're going to animate an ab object along the, a motion path using a NURBS curve as the motion path. And um, going to learn how to use a flow path and attach lattices that will deform along that path and you're going to need that technique if you're going to be animating a fish for your final project. And then we're going to use nonlinear deformers. <coughs> um, hierarchy is a structure of um, parent-child relationships. Comprehending and utilizing the parent-child relationships is mandatory and crucial to mastering 3D animation. You're simply not a 3D animator until you get this. Okay, so we're going to learn um, just how to get started on hierarchical animation. This involves creating a node structure with uh, proper grouping and pivotal placements for efficient keyframing. This example will be a desk lamp, like the kind you see on those um, old Pixar shorts with pivoting arms. Also note that the order of operations is opposite here. Set positions, then set hierarchy. Um, open the file lamp.ma We can close those extra windows for the moment. And what I want to do is open the um, hierarchy window, hypergraph hierarchy, under Windows General Editors. And this gives us a look at the current node structure. This, again, is not the only way to visualize the node structure in the um, scene. The outliner shows you the node structure as well, um, as, long, as well as uh, hypergraph connections. Now, this um, upper arm, lower arm lampshade corresponds to different parts of Oh my heavens, that wasn't supposed to happen. Come on out of there. There we go. Still not doing what I want it to. Okay, sorry. This uh, upper arm, lower arm corresponds to the different parts of the lamp. And each of these pieces that you see here is a child of the node. You can tell by the indentation and which squares are under. For example, upper arm has this P cube, surface, surface, object parented under this one node. Lower arm has four objects. Lampshade has three, one of which is a NURBS. So um, each of these is a hierarchy structure in which the sub-objects all inherit the attributes of the parent. Okay. Now I'm going to set that aside for a minute.
and I am going to go into some different um, things here that you need to know about putting this lamp together. So first of all, let's talk about selecting. Um, and I've said this before, but it's good to reiterate here. When you're selecting a hierarchy structure where these different objects are parented under a parent node, the way you want to select it is by selecting the parent node. What you do not want to do is drag a marquee around it and select all of the individual objects and the parent node. That's not what you want. To select only the parent node, there's a few different ways to do this. Um, you can do it in your hypergraph window by clicking the parent node there. You can do it in your outliner window by clicking the parent node of each individual bit here. The other thing you can do is if you select an individual object or if you did draw a marquee around that structure, you can press the up arrow and select the parent node. So it's really important to remember that. And the reason this matters is because each of these individual objects, if moved separately, will um, they will gain their own you know, or or rotated or whatever it is you do to them they will all gain their own attributes and um, you know this is a good example like why is this happening because um, they're all gaining their own rotation which is being combined with the rotation that they're inheriting from the parent so they're rotating individually as well as um, picking up that parent rotation. Sometimes you'll get this weird double move, like like they'll move twice as far, or, or maybe sometimes one object will be drifting away um, at a rate of twice the movement. Um, that's because of your selection and because of your parenting um, setup. So uh, when you when you do this, like I said, really, really crucial to understand parent-child relationships. So, okay. All right, my speech is done. Let's start putting this thing together. Um, in the hypergraph or outliner, or however you want to do it, select the lower arm and, again, the parent node, not each individual object. And with the de with the move tool active, we're going to press the D key. I think it's D on uh, Mac as well. And that moves the pivot point. You can see how the how the icon changed. So that means we're going to move the pivot point. I'm going to do this in the side view. And what I want to do is center the pivot point in the center of the cylinder on the left side of the arm. There we go. And you don't have to get this super exact, but I'm going to try to get it just a little more exact. Like that. That'll do. And so now when I turn on the rotate tool, it will rotate around that pivot point. And we're going to position that arm so that it sits in the um, pedestal uh, on the base here. So basically right here. And I'm not worried about getting it super exact, but I'm going to get it pretty close here. Try to. And let's rotate the lower arm to um, an X of 40 degrees. So it's right about there if you want to type it in manually. As always, you can do it right there. 
Okay, so, so far so good. I'm going to select the upper arm, and I'm going to use my up arrow to get the whole hierarchy. So that again, that up arrow gives me the parent node. I'm going to center the pivot on the right side of the upper arm. And again, I'm going to do that in the side view. That's not the type of thing that you do in perspective. That's pretty good right there, but I think I can get it just a tiny bit better. There we go. And I'm not concerned about getting it absolutely perfect. Up arrow, I press the up arrow. Yes, I drew a marquee around it, but then I press the up arrow. And I'm going to move this into position so that this bit of the arm is now connected to the lower arm. And let's rotate that to X160. Or thereabouts. Okay, so finally the lampshade group I'm going to move into position and I am going to press the D key to edit that pivot point and I'm going to move that to the center of the base of the neck so that it rotates around that pivot right there. Okay. Now we haven't changed anything about our hierarchy structure at this point. So what I want to do is I want to start by making the, um, the lower arm I want to start by making the upper arm the child of the shade. In the hypergraph hierarchy window, select upper arm. With middle mouse button, click drag the node on top of lower arm. Sorry, okay. So that makes the upper arm the child of the lower arm. The transformation will now flow down to the upper arm's node. So upper arm now inherits everything that the lower arm does. Select lamp base, no, lamp shade, and middle click and drag onto the upper arm node right here. And that again makes the lampshade the child of the upper arm. Now let's select the lower arm and make all of this the child of the base by middle click dragging lower arm over to lamp base. Great. Now if I select base, everything moves, rotates, etc. along the base. If I select lower arm and rotate it, all that stuff inherits the lower arm rotation. If I select lampshade, lampshade is the child of all the other parts, so nothing inherits the lampshade's rotation. If I select upper arm, then 
the lampshade inherits the upper arms rotation. And with this setup, um, Maya won't prevent us from moving it around, but it shouldn't be moved um, other than by the base, unless you want to break your lamp. So, and it's going to be that way with bones as well. You can also constrain these rotations. Um, just that's just an FYI. It's not something that's really a necessity right now, but to prevent yourself from doing like things like this, or I should say more accurately, your your team of animators from doing anything like this, you can set constraints that will prevent this from happening. Like maybe the most you want this to rotate is right here or up to here or something like that. You can constrain the rotation to that that arc and it won't go any further. And also it shouldn't be rotating like to the side at all. So those kind of things can set can be set as constraints. Uh, to make the selection easier, we can make a handle. That way we don't need to use the hypergraph or the outliner to select everything if you don't want to. And it makes it a little easier and selection handles have the number one priority when clicking on stuff in the interface. So if you hit a selection handle, it won't select everything else. Um, so if you select lamp base, for example, actually we can do all these at, at the same time. So we can select lamp base and then shift select lower arm, upper arm, and lamp shade if you want to make a selection handle for each of the four main com uh, component groups. Um, and then we can go to display, uh, transform display, selection handles. And then when you click on, basically when you, if you hit the selection handle, it's only going to select the selection handle. Even by drawing a marquee around it, you can't, you can't um, break your selection that way as long as you hit that selection handle. So you might want to use those when you're doing hierarchies, especially. Um, they're helpful in other ways, too, but keep those in mind. <clears throat> now, um, since you are creating um, your own lamp animation, you can feel free to animate this and have it jump around just that's just for fun um, put a maybe a spotlight inside to shine out of the lamp give it a little floor to stand on something like that so let's do a new scene let's clear that scene out and let's get into skeletons and kinematics and we're going to learn now how to create a skeleton using the same um, style of parenting that I just showed, and then we're going to bind it to the skin. And that skeleton will then deform the skin. What is kinematics? Kinematics is a term describing the motion or the study of motion. It is motion in the most abstract sense without regard to force, mass, velocity, acceleration, or the positional values that produce motion. In computer animation, kinematics is generally referenced when animating links of parented objects, such as those which make up a robot's arms or legs, or when working with a chain of parented bones inside a solid limb. Within these types of joints between objects or bones, we generally deal with rotational values for the individual objects or bones in the chain. 
Forward kinematics is the common type of motion, um, which is generated by keyframing, um, movements, rotations, and so on of any objects uh, uh, in the chain, parents or children. The animator decides what the motion of all joints should be. Therefore, the motion of the last object or bone in the chain is determined indirectly by the accumulation of all transformations by all the parent items up the chain. Inverse kinematics, sometimes called goal-oriented motion, um, is when you have a hierarchy of two or more objects or bones and a goal object selected for your objects or bones in the chain. Usually the last item in the chain or the last uh, child is the one that receives the goal. IK, we're going to call that inverse kinematics, we're going to call that IK. Um, IK works best with um, usually arms and legs, uh, also fingers. We're going to actually do it on a finger. Um, and it makes it so instead of positioning every little um, every little joint to to say swing a sword or take a step, you instead position the goal for where you want the foot to be and the other joints try to fall in line within the constraints that you set. So I'll show you how to do this. Let's open um, finger. And we're going to go to go to the side view and I'm going to put the wireframe view on that. Side view is a good place to start uh, or I don't know front view or side view really. Um, and we want to be in the rigging sub menu. And you want to select skeleton create joints. And every time you click with this Create Joint tool, you will get a joint. So we start at the base. The, the joint um, that you first lay down always starts at the core of the movement, wherever all the movement originates. So right now it's the base of the finger. On a full character, it's usually the pelvis. So keep that in mind. So let's do one joint there. And then when I click the second joint, it creates the bone in between. The bones, let's put the third joint there, like where they would naturally go. But then there's going to be a fourth joint where there is no, no joint normally. So that's almost the same thing as the bones in your actual finger, as you can see. Um, slight difference, but not much. And what happens is it creates the bones according to the parent relationship. This is automatically the parent of all four. This one is the child of the first one and the parent of the remaining three. This one is the child of the first two and the parent of the remaining one. So you get the idea. And then let's press enter to finish that. And shift select the mesh and click skin, bind skin. Okay, so once the skin is bound, and only once the skin is bound, the joints will flex the mesh and deform the mesh. Now I'm animating this in a forward kinematic style. In other words, whatever I animate in the parent, it is inherited by the children. And I can set each individual joint and I can uh, animate it that way and that uh, that works fine in many situations uh, but with a human being or a living character a lot of times your inverse kinematics is a better way to go um, so what I want to do is to create an IK handle to get the IK working we go to skeleton 
create IK handle. Click on the first joint at the base and then click on the last joint at the fingertip. And there's your IK handle at the fingertip and that's the goal. All joints will attempt to point at that goal as much as they can. So if I pull it away, as you can see, it's trying to point at it. And if I move it within the constraints, uh, within the, um, the joints, then it bends. So trying to hit that, that guy at all times. And again, you can set constraints that will prevent it from wrapping around over itself. Once that's set up, you can also do some degree of forward kinematics if you wish. And selecting that handle can be a little bit tricky. So if you want to create a selection handle again, go ahead. So, and then once I get back to the IK handle, I've rotated this joint, but then the IK handle takes over. So to animate this is just like anything else. So um, I've got my IK handle um, attributes over here in the channel box. And I will set the translate keys and we'll just do a motion. I'll press Shift W to set all the translate keys over here. And I'll just do a translate here and a translate here at frame 90. So this is just, I'm only moving the IK handle around. And that creates this animation. Okay, let's do a new scene. And let's open robot.ma. Okay, and in this example, um, instead of deforming the mesh, we're going to create a bone structure and parent the objects to the joints to create an easy to move um, uh, puppet setup. What's the word I'm looking for? Puppet rig. And it will, it will make all the joints move, it'll make all the parts rotate but it will not make the surfaces deform, the mesh deform, you understand? So in that finger where it's bending the finger, it's, that's not going to happen because this is a robot. These, these parts are rigid, um, whatever, metal probably, or maybe some kind of plastic, but um, they shouldn't be deforming. We just want them to move at the joints. So to accomplish that, we'll use the the bones, but instead of binding it to the skin, we'll parent it to the individual parts so that um, they will inherit the movement but will not deform. Okay, to create a skeleton for the legs, I am going to um, maximize the side view here. And I'm going to go to Skeleton, Create Joints. I'm going to place the first joint at the hip. The second joint at the knee and the third joint at the ankle. And press enter. Now sometimes it's helpful to view your models as like a uh, see-through kind of thing. You can go to wireframe if you want. 
Um, but you can also do other types of view. Wireframe on shaded. Um, if you go to shading, I like to do x-ray joints sometimes when I'm creating joints and then you can see just you can see the normal shading but you can see through if there's joints underneath. Uh, another one is just regular x-ray. You can use that one maybe. Just a matter of preference. So I'm going to change my front view to wireframe. <coughs> And I want to rename this joint um, root. And we're going to rename this joint left knee. Actually, that's wrong. That first joint was not supposed to be root. It was supposed to be left hip. left knee and left ankle. Now select that top joint and move it over to his left. Not ours, his. Press control D to duplicate. sure this is symmetrical here. Doing this in the front view. Okay, pretty good. And I'm going to take these knee joints and kind of center them a little bit. And let's rename these because they will have come out as left hip one, left ankle one, and so on. So we want this one to be right hip. And this one will be right knee. And this one will be right ankle. And let's go to Skeleton Create Joints again, and I am going to put a joint in the center of the pelvis. And let's name that joint Root. That's the one that's actually supposed to be Root. And I'm going to use the top and front view to center it where it should be. Use snap if you want it to get it exactly dead center on the uh, front view. And let's go to the outliner and we're going to pair it this um, with left and right hip. So I'm going to grab the one that I want to be the child, left hip, and drag that on the root. And that actually creates the bone in between once the parent is there. Did you see that? I'll do the same thing with right hip, and it'll create a bone between the root and the right hip joint. So that those bones actually just indicate the parent relationships on your joints, as you can see. So. Um, I want to create an IK handle. And I want to set some options on this IK handle. So I want to go to Skeleton, 
IK handle, create IK handle option box. And for this one, I'm going to turn on sticky. So sticky is um, something that will help. Uh, it used to be called sticky feet. Now it's just called sticky handle. Um, it's usually used on feet. And what that does is it helps your feet to not skate as your uh, character moves along, um, probably walking or whatever it is it's doing. It will try to keep the foot planted to the ground or whatever it is. It'll try to keep it planted where you put it when the rest of the character is moving. So turn on sticky. And then we're going to um, click on right hip and then right angle. And this is probably best done in perspective view. And I'm going to create IK handle again. We're going to click on left hip and then left angle. ankle. Okay, so it's very similar. Um, again, it tries to find its target, um, but the sticky will come into play if you uh, animate something. It will be helpful for its um, uh, for its walking. So, um, what we want to do now is parent the different body parts of the robot to the skeleton. Uh, let's actually let's name these so that we know which side they're on. This is the right IK handle, and this one is the left IK handle. You can rename in the outline or two. Okay, so um, let's unfurl that root joint and all of its subs unfurl all that stuff and um, let's do turn off uh, turn this uh, turn this layer mode to regular and I'm going to do this in x-ray shading mode Actually, that okay. That was supposed to have been templated when we started. Whatever, it's fine. Doesn't matter. And we're gonna, for example, take the right thigh, middle click, drag that down to the right hip joint. And we're going to make that the child of the right hip joint. So now wherever that right hip moves, the right thigh will go with it. But again, it's not deforming. That would not be what we want for this particular guy. Uh, right foot. becomes the child of, no, right lower leg becomes the child of right ankle. We leave foot alone for the moment. Left thigh becomes the child of left hip. I'm just doing these by middle click dragging on the outliner. Left lower leg becomes the child of left knee I missed on the right leg. I'm going to undo a couple of these. Step back a few. Right lower leg goes to right knee. I think I just missed and accidentally slipped down a little bit. Left thigh goes to left hip. Child of left hip left lower leg becomes the child of left knee. Upper body 
becomes the child of root. And you should be able to grab the root joint and have it do this kind of kind of a bouncy kind of motion. Should be able to rotate it a little bit and have it kind of turn side to side. Now the feet are not coming along with it. And what we would probably do, um, I would probably instinctively make the left foot and the right foot the child of the left ankle and the right ankle. And there would be nothing wrong with that necessarily. It would be a fine solution. Left foot, left ankle. Uh, but I'm going to show you a better solution. So right foot, right ankle. Not bad, but instead of doing that, I'm going to take the IK handles and make them the children of the feet. handle becomes the child of left foot. And then I can grab the feet and move them around. I can still pull it away from where it's supposed to be, so I could always set constraints that prevent this, but that kind of works better. And I can grab the root and most movement should originate at the root so I can always do um, the main movements from starting from the root joint. And as you can see nothing is deforming but we have this lovely rig that allows us to completely animate this character. You can tell uh, it's a good sign that you've got a good rig when it's fun to play with. If you're sitting here fiddling with this thing and just going woo wee yay, then that's a sign that you that you've got a good rig. <clears throat> so that's a good thing. Alright, let's clear this scene out and move on to path animations. Let's open the file called street.ma Save. And I will close all these extraneous windows for now. Here is street.ma and um, there's a curve already provided. I'm going to make another one just to make it. So um, this is just an example curve that you might have. So that, that's going to become an animation path. So let's create a CV curve. Or EP, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do CV. Do not create the CV curve or EP curve, as the case may be, in perspective view. To it in the orthographic views. Why? Because you don't know how deep past the camera it's going to put that point as you click it. So I'm going to just do a couple points here, randomly selected. I'm going to have it go under the bridge and around the back. Press enter to create the curve and 
let's go to component mode, go to control vertex, and I'm going to pull that vertex over this way. I think I'm going to go to edit points actually instead. I like those a little better. <coughs> Let's do a selection constraint because my I can't select this very easily. I'm going to open up my selection constraints and I just want curve objects. getting a street so by constraining the selection I won't I won't be able to click on that street anymore or anything else but the curve objects right now so um, that's just a little convenience thing so I'm just gonna kind of shape this curve a little bit have this guy go behind the the little drugstore thing and under the bridge and stuff and he'll end, or, end around there. So that's going to be uh, the flight path for our guy. It doesn't really matter what you made yours, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly like mine, but the point is it's a curve and they're going to follow that curve, just pretty basic. So, And don't forget to turn your selection constraints back on because when you try to go back and select your objects, it's not going to let you and you're going to be confused. So um, make sure you turn those selection constraints back on. Okay, and let's import our guy. We got a little guy in a jetpack here, so let's do a file import. This is a way of pulling other objects into an existing scene. And we can go soldier guy import and I think the frame mismatch is okay I think the frame rate that I have set here will take over yeah okay it does so don't worry about the frame mismatch <coughs> now what we're gonna do is to create this um, as an animation, we're going to attach it, uh, the character, to the curve. Select the soldier. You can use, there's a selection handle that he comes with that you can use if you can see that selection handle. Again, selection handles take precedence over every, everything else. So if you have nothing selected and you draw a marquee that includes a selection handle, it will take precedence over whatever else you drew that marquee around. And then we want to shift select the curve. From rigging, from the rigging menu select, uh, set, we're going to choose constrain motion path, attach to motion path um, option box. Well, Let's just do, let's start with attached to motion path. Okay. So, and this is what we could have fixed with the option box, but it attaches to the motion path, and if you press play, it follows the motion path just fine. Sort of. Except that its orientation is to the side instead of, that doesn't look like he's flying, it looks like he's, I don't know. Doesn't look like he's controlling his flying. So we can do that by changing the orientation um, to the motion path. If we go on the attribute editor and go to the motion path node, 
you will notice um, that the front axis is at X. We're going to change that front axis to Z. And I think that'll do it. Okay, so. And I'm not going to worry about the dip underneath the, the street. I'm just going to not deal with it. Um, but this is a pretty good motion path. Um, what we can do now is um, add a bank so that we can help it turn these bends in a way that is more like flying. So if you add a bank, that means it'll do a little rotation as it turns the corner. Um, and the bank scale, if it's at 1, means no change. Um, 5 means it'll do about uh, a little bit of a rotation as it, as it turns the corner. So I don't know how well that's showing up, but... This is a little bit of a steep angle over here, so he does a real quick bank right around that. That's where it shows up the most on my curve. So, um, but you should also see it. It should be showing up a little bit there more than it is. But let's try a bank of like seven. And just give it just a touch more bank. Yeah. Okay. So it's showing up there a little bit showing up at the beginning curve a little bit. Um, this just makes him bank to the side a little bit as he turns those corners. Now the animation is somewhat linear in the sense that um, he does speed up and slow down at the uh, uh, beginning and the end. He starts with a um, with a speed up and at the end he, he finishes off with a slowdown. Um, you can control the speed by um, keyframing along the way which will kind of speed up and slow down certain parts. So just for example uh, if I go to um, about frame 130 or so let's go back a little bit. I'm gonna go because this is a different motion path. I'm gonna go to frame 76 right where it's about here. And go to Constrain Motion Paths, Set Motion Path Key. Now I can interactively change the position of the marker. Click on the number 130 marker on the motion path. I'm sorry, on mine it's 75, whatever the number is for you. You may need to tumble a little bit or dolly around just to get it, and you might need to get him out of the way. And you can click and drag this to move it up and down the motion curve. Um, if you move it past a certain point, he will not be able to hit that point at that time. So I'm going to move it back a little bit. And what we're going to see is a quicker motion from here to here, but it's going to give us a little more time to get to frame 73. It's going to be a little slower from here to here. So now if I set another motion path key here, you'll really see it a little more. Constrain motion path key. Uh, I have to select the object, don't I? Constrain motion path key. And let's move the and I'm going to take this one and I'm 
bring it back. So, so this is going to be a slow movement from this first key to this second key. It's going to he's going to take his time. And if I If I continue to move those around, I can change the timing between those two keys as well as the lead in time and lead out. So, for example, I can make it a really slow movement by moving those two keys close together, and the movement outside of that will be even quicker. So, now he's going to move slowly from there to there. And if I want it to be a quicker movement, so in other words, he hits this position on frame 73 and this position on frame 125. So now that's going to be a whoosh, that's going to be a quick swish around that little and this part will be slower. That'll be 73 frames to get there and then he hits that and zooms away. Get the idea? Now we're going to work with some flow path lattices. Um, one will deform your object along the motion path and the other will uh, be a, a freeform deformer. Uh, so these will create a cage around your objects that um, will deform it, like bend it and twist it or in you know squish it or whatever. To introduce you to the lattice deformer, um, we're going to use a flow path object to deform an object that is already animated along a motion path. This uses a lattice to bend an object automatically as it takes corners around a curve like like the uh, type of thing we just animated. Um, so let's do a file open and go to fish.ma. So this one is Again, close the extra windows. So this is obviously, um, if you're going to be animating a fish for your final project, um, this is obviously something you're going to want. We've got the motion path already set up. This is basically the same thing that we just did. Um, so it's sort of swimming along nicely. Everything's sort of good. A uh, fish does not bank when it swims, so you don't want to turn on bank. But um, but there is sort of a problem here, and that is that uh, it just remains stiff and rigid as it moves along its path. So obviously, we don't want we don't want that to happen. We want it to bend as it turns corners, like a fish naturally would. So use the selection handle to select the fish, and. We want to, again, we've already set up the path animation, so we want to go to now to constrain. Uh, we might want to be on frame one for this. I'm not entirely sure if it matters, but just in case, I'm going to jump back to frame one. And let's go to constrain, motion path, and then go to flow path object. And almost immediately, it's good to go. Um, except that there will be some glitches. This is pretty much to be expected. Um, you can see as it turns this corner, for example, that it loses some vertices that wander off, and that's because they're getting outside of the cage. So the cage always seems to come in a little too small. I don't really know why, but for whatever reason, you just have to um, size it up by about 10% or so. So um, from the win uh, from the outliner window, if you go to FFD1 base, you want to take that base cage and just size that up until that goes away, something like that. And that will solve that glitch. Now the other glitch that basically always happens is the first few frames let's call it the first 20 frames, will do this thing. 
there will be no smooth motion along that first little bit. Um, so plan on cutting that bit of your animation out. Just plan on animating an extra 20 frames at the beginning of your uh, fish animation that will be cut out. Um, and then your animation will actually start like right here on frame 21. Why does it do that? I don't know. How do you fix it? I don't know. I'm not aware of any way to fix it. So there's also a little bit of glitching going on at the end here that's probably just coming from um, like the end of this has a Bezier curve coming into it. So it's kind of trying to curve to the side as it reaches that last point. Um, so if you made another point beyond this that continued along, if you didn't want it to bend like that, it, it would probably be fine. Or again, just cut off the last five frames of animation there, or the last ten frames or whatever you need to do. Um, so otherwise very, very useful to animating your fish for your final project. Okay, let's clear that scene out. Okay, now I want you to open the file called rocket.ma. There it is. This scene contains one rocket, and it has a selection handle. There's the selection handle. Um, select the rocket using the selection handle. Um, if you wanted to introduce squash and stretch to this movement, you could use the squash tool. I'm sorry, the, the, the uh, scale tool. Um, but the problem with the scale tool, we saw a few problems with using this for squash and stretch on the uh, bouncing ball an assignment animation. Um, and it can also <coughs> cause your ship to lose volume, which is not supposed to happen on a squash and stretch. It's supposed to maintain the same volume. And you could compensate for that a little bit by stretching it in the other direction. But there's a better way to do this. Um, there's a few better ways to do this. There's, uh, there's a lattice cage, which we're going to use on this one. And um, I'll show you another way after we get done with the rocket. So um, let's do a, uh, under the rigging menu, we, we're going to do a deform lattice. By default, the lattice is divided twice along the width. And even though the rocket is made of several objects, the lattice is going to deform all parts proportionally as though they were all part of one object. Now if I switch to component mode, we get the lattice points and that's what we want. So just for an example, I could select the lattice points in the middle and stretch them out to get a bulge or squish them in to get a tiny rocket. Uh, okay. And if you want to get rid of your lattice tweaks, you can go to deform. Uh, I thought there was a interesting. Okay, I thought there was a remove lattice tweaks here. Maybe it's in a different place, or maybe it's not there anymore. So whatever. You can just use Control-Z, or just Z. Let's change the resolution of the lattice. And uh, I've already got my attribute editor open here. In the T divisions, I'm going to change that to 3. And that'll make it a little easier. And let's test the influence again. Now it's deforming um, a greater portion of the rocket. Now this scene already is animated.
So as you can see, the rocket takes off. Okay. Now, according to the principles of animation, we should have it anticipate this movement as opposed to just lifting off. And we also need the lattice to move with the rocket. So the first thing we need to do is open up the outliner and parent the lattice to the object. Let's select the out uh, in the outliner. Let's select FFD1 lattice and FFD1 base, and Control G to group them together. And let's call that lattice group. And now let's parent that to the rocket. So I'm going to middle click drag that up to the rocket and that will make that object the child of the rocket so now it will follow along with the rocket. Now just to have some anticipation here um, I'm going to go back to component mode and we can close the outliner. I'm going to select these points and I am going to do a shift S to set regular S to set keyframes. And we'll have it do a little bit of a squash that will create um, kind of an anticipation. So you know what, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to select all of the lattice points. No, I'm going to select these four and these four. Okay, I'm going to leave the bottom lattice points unselected. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, sorry about that. S to set that keyframe. And I'm going to go to frame 32 to set the neutral keyframe again once it's about up there. And somewhere around frame 10, I am going to, I'm going to grab the middle keyframes and bulge them out a little bit, set keyframes, then I'm going to grab all of the keyframes, squash them down and move them down a little bit, and S to set keyframes. All the keyframes except for the bottom ones, I'm not messing with the bottom ones. And I am going to For these couple of frames right at the point of liftoff, right around frame 29 or 30, I'm going to select the middle points and stretch them inward. I'm using the middle handle so they stretch symmetrically. And press S so it just gives a quick And I want it to stay bulged for a little longer, maybe till about frame 24. So I'm going to set a frame at, uh, I'll bulge it out just a tad at frame 24-ish, and set a keyframe there too. So that should give me about the movement that I want. Okay. 
And that is not what I would call perfection, but just for a quick little demonstration to give you the idea of what I'm going for. I think it's decent enough. Okay, let's clear that scene out. And I'll show you one last bit of deformers to animate with. Let's open the file called... Um, I think it's called deform types. There it is. Each of the nonlinear deform types are used on just a regular NURBS cube. Um, they are wave, bend, sine, flare, squash, and twist. So what we were just doing could have could have also been done with a squash deformer, as opposed to a lattice cage. Nothing wrong with either one, just different ways to accomplish the same thing. Sometimes one might be better than the other. This gives us a um, some control uh, in a different way over where the where the um, bulge is going to be, if you want it to be a little high or a little low. So, um, and you can take the you can take the object as well and move it through the deformer. There's two objects right on top of each other here, but and it creates this kind of this kind of movement. So it will bulge out as it passes over that deformer. And they can all do that. Remember to select the whole object. So, this is the twist deformer, as you can see. Now, just um, experiment with these, take a little time to play with them. You can um, you can animate all of these in one of two ways. Um, one animation, um, one way to create animation is by moving the object through the deformer, and the other way is to animate the attributes of the deformer. So, with flare, I can have this curve be whatever it is. I'm going to right click on that and set a key. Let's change the curve to 1 and set a key there as well. And there's the curve animating. And I'll set a key on the low bound. The low bound is where this bottom ring appears. Okay, the other side was the bottom. All right. And so you can key any value. Remember that. You, you don't have to, um, you don't have to limit it to movement. Anything that has a value can be keyed. To actually apply these deformers to your own objects, you're going to select the objects and go to deform nonlinear deformer, and here they are. Bend, flare, sign, squash, twist, and wave. The squash uh, deformer will ensure on its own that when you're squashing and stretching your object, it does not lose any volume, so that is super handy.